Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson, and I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases, especially written for people learning English. Coming up on the program, Dan Friedel reports on record high water temperatures in Florida. Gregory Stockel has a story on Japan's export ban on computer chips. Dominic Varela and Jill Robbins have a story on the 2024 Olympic torch, and Faith Perlo explains the difference between the climate and the environment. Later, we listen to part two of "The Law of Life" by Jack London. But first, scientists say that a body of water at the southern end of Florida reached a new high temperature. Of over 38 degrees Celsius early this week, weather scientists called meteorologists say they measured the high seawater temperatures in Manatee Bay on both Sunday and Monday. They believe the water temperature may be the world's highest ever recorded. A floating device that sends information to the U.S. Weather Agency (NOAA). Recorded the temperature. A 2020 study showed that Kuwait Bay reached 37.6 degrees Celsius. That was thought to be the highest ever water temperature. Jeff Masters is a meteorologist with Yale Climate Connections, a weather news service. This is a hot tub, he said. A hot tub is a heated water pool. Many people use for treating sore muscles. Jacuzzi, a company that makes hot tubs, recommends a water temperature of about 38 degrees Celsius. Masters and Brian McNulty, a meteorologist at the University of Miami, both said the temperatures might not be an official record because the water is close to land. And contains seagrass. However, McNulty said, "It's amazing. The high temperatures could put sea life, such as coral, in danger." Andrew Ibarra is a researcher for NOAA. He took a small boat out to the area called Chica Rocks to look at coral, and said, "I found that the entire reef." Was bleached out. Bleaching is when coral loses its color. It is a sign that the sea creatures are in danger of dying. Ian Enox studies coral for NOAA. He said coral bleaching was almost never seen before the 1980s. Now he said, we've reached the point where it's become routine. The high water temperature in Florida goes along with all-time high sea surface temperatures in April, May, and June. NOAA also said water temperatures in the North Atlantic, near the Canadian province of Newfoundland, are five to six degrees Celsius warmer than usual. I'm Dan Friedel. Japan recently put in place export controls on the latest microchip or semiconductor technologies. Observers said the move targets China. Japan's export controls follow other recent restrictions enforced by the United States and the Netherlands. To other major producers of the most modern semiconductors, 
Japan listed 23 kinds of semiconductor technology that have export restrictions. The restrictions started July 23rd. They include different kinds of advanced microchip manufacturing equipment. The controls will affect China's ability to make advanced chips. Researcher Yoshiaki Takayama of the Japan Institute for International Affairs in Tokyo said. The Japanese measure complements U.S. led export control measures because the number of companies with the capacity to manufacture cutting edge chips is extremely limited, Takayama told VOA. He added the Japanese measure makes it difficult for China not only to import advanced chips. But also to manufacture them. He added that China appears to be starting to produce less advanced semiconductors. The United States banned the export of some advanced microchips and semiconductor manufacturing technology to China in October and urged Western allies to do the same. The Netherlands is another important producer of semiconductors. That country enforced similar measures in June. Taiwan has also promised to support the U.S. policy. The U.S. says it wants to prevent China from using the technology for military purposes. The group of seven large economic powers discussed the issue at its meeting in Japan in May. The allies agreed on the need to de risk from possible Chinese economic coercion. Members said they want to avoid becoming dependent on China for semiconductor technologies. These combined measures. Will severely affect China's ability to keep up with Western technology, Takayama said. It will hurt China's ability to manufacture state of the art semiconductors and increase its manufacturing capacity. He said that today's scientific progress is largely the result of big data research and computer technology rather than repeated trial and error. And he added that it seems that China, with limited availability of the latest semiconductors, Could fall behind in scientific and technological research and development. Unlike the United States and the Netherlands, Japan did not name China as the target of its export restrictions. The restrictions affect 160 countries. However, China still reacted angrily. In a retaliatory move, China banned the import of semiconductors from the American company Micron in May. Chinese officials said the ban was over national security concerns. Takayama said some companies in Japan fear China will seek to restrict their imports. China has additionally threatened to restrict exports of two important metals in the production of semiconductors, gallium and germanium. I'm Gregory Stockel. A 
Olympic Games organizers in France presented the 2024 Olympic torch that will light the summer games in the country a year from now. In the Olympic torch tradition, many people carry the torch in turn from Greece to the current location of the games. After it has traveled thousands of kilometers, the torch will light the Olympic cauldron at the opening ceremony of the next Olympic Games. French designer Mathieu Leanau created the torch, which is 70 centimeters long and made of lightweight steel. Leanau said its shape is inspired by the famous Seine River, which flows through Paris. He said the torch is equal from top to bottom and all around the middle, which stands for equality between athletes. The twisting shape of the torch represents peace. The torch was made with lightweight steel. Its lower half copies the movement of the Seine, along which the opening ceremony will take place for over 500,000 viewers. Leonel said he wants the torch to represent the kind of event that Paris 2024 hopes to be. I wanted to move away from the torch appearing as an object of conquest, Leonel said. He also told reporters that designing the torch was much more technical than he thought it would be. The magic is not the torch itself, but the flame, Leonel said. The torch will begin burning in Olympia, Greece, where the first Olympics were held on April 16. The Games will begin in Paris on July 26, 2024. On May 8, the torch will arrive in the Mediterranean city of Marseille. It will then pass through several important places, which include Strasbourg, the Pantheon in Paris, the Mont Saint-Michel, and multiple French territories. Tony Estange, the Paris 2024 chief, said the torch is very, very beautiful. He also said it is very pure. It's perfectly balanced in the hand. I'm Dominic Varela. And I'm Jill Robbins. there. This week on Ask a Teacher, we will answer a question about the difference between environment and climate. Hello, VOA Learning English. My name is Sukhwant, and I am from India. I have a question about the difference between environment and climate. Thank you so much, Sukhwant. Thank you, Sukhwant for this important question. Climate is part of the environment. Let's look at the meanings of each. Let's start with environment. Environment has many meanings. Your environment can be everything that surrounds you. Different conditions and objects make up your environment. My home environment is a peaceful place that includes my husband and my pets. Environment can also be social and cultural elements that contribute to your life or community. The phrase nature or nurture describes the debate about whether your biology or your environment shapes you. When we are talking about science, the environment is all the physical, biological, and chemical conditions around you. The environment includes things like climate, geography, diversity of plants and animals, and many other things. The environment affects the condition and survival of the things within it. 
and those things likewise affect the environment. Deserts are environments with land features like sand or dry ground, and extreme temperatures of hot and cold. We must protect our environment. Note that the word environment can be used in specific professions, like computer science and linguistics, or the study of language. Let's move on to climate. Climate has several different meanings. In science, climate is the overall weather pattern for an area over time. Climate includes amounts of rain and snow, temperatures and other weather conditions. Climate is part of the environment. Climate can also describe an area that has a certain kind of climate. She moved to the southern U.S. last year for the warmer climate. And lastly, climate can mean a general atmosphere or situation in a place or period. The political climate of the 1950s in the United States was marked by fears about the spread of communism. Please let us know if these explanations and examples have helped you, Sukwant. Do you have a question about American English? Send us an email at learningenglish at voanews.com. And that's Ask a Teacher. I'm Faith Perlow. week's Ask a Teacher. Welcome back to the show, Faith. Hi, Dan. Thanks for having me back. Do you know much about earth science? A little. I took an earth science class in college, but it's been a while. So I have for you and our listeners a word origin or history lesson combined with earth science. I'm a little scared, but okay. So which word, climate or environment? Climate. It has a more interesting history. According to Merriam-Webster's dictionary, climate comes from the ancient Greek word klima, spelled with a K. Klima means slope or a steep incline, like going up a hill. It comes from the idea that if you stand on the equator or the imaginary line that goes through the middle of the earth, you will see the celestial poles. What are celestial poles? Celestial poles are those points in the sky that are exactly above the north and south poles of the Earth. This does sound like an Earth science lesson, Faith. What do those points have to do with climate? The further north you go, the sky appears tilted because the celestial pole in the north rises above the horizon. So, the ancient Greeks called this tilt klima. Eventually, klima came to mean latitude, the measured distance north or south of the equator. And klimata came to mean the seven latitudinal regions, like uh, the Tropic of Cancer in the Northern Hemisphere or the Tropic of Capricorn in the Southern Hemisphere. Think about it, Dan. What does latitude have to do with climate? Ah, I understand. Climate depends on your latitude. Exactly. So if you're closer to the north or south poles, you will experience a colder climate. If you are closer to the equator, you'll experience a hotter climate. This was not only a language lesson, Dan, but a science class, too. I love it, and I hope you and our listeners enjoyed it. I did enjoy it. Thanks, Faith. The Law of Life by Jack London Part 2 Koshkush placed another stick on the fire and let his thoughts travel deeper into the past. There was the time of the great famine. He had lost his mother in that famine. 
In the summer, the usual plentiful catch of fish had failed, and the tribe looked forward to the winter and the coming of the caribou. Then the winter came, but with it there were no caribou. Never had the like been known, not even in the lives of the old men. The rabbits had not produced any young, and the dogs were skin and bone. And through the long darkness the children wept and died. So did the women and the old men. Not one in ten lived to meet the sun when it returned in the spring. That was a famine. But he had seen times of plenty, too, when the meat spoiled before it could be eaten. Even the dogs grew fat and were worth nothing from eating too much. In these times they let the animals and birds go unkilled, and the tents were filled with newly born children. Then it was that the men remembered old quarrels and crossed to the south and to the west to kill ancient enemies. He remembered when a boy, during a time of plenty, when he saw a moose pulled down by the wolves. Zingha lay with him in the snow and watched. Zingha was his friend, who later became the best of hunters. One day he fell through an air hole in the frozen Yukon River. They found him a month later. "'frozen to the ice where he had attempted to climb out. "'Zingha and he had gone out that day to play at hunting "'in the manner of their fathers. "'Near a creek they discovered the fresh track of a moose, "'and with it the tracks of many wolves. "'An old one,' Zingha said. "'It is an old one who cannot travel as fast as the others. "'The wolves have separated him from his brothers.' And they will never leave him. And it was so. It was their way. By day and by night, never resting, biting at his heels, they would stay with him to the end. How Zingha and he had felt the desire to see blood. The finish would be a sight to remember. Eagerly they started up the trail. Even he, Koskush, who was not a good tracker, could have followed it blind. It was so wide. They were not far behind the hunt, reading its awful story at every step. Now they saw where the moose had stopped to face his attackers. On every side the snow had been stamped heavily. In the middle there were the deep footprints of the moose. All about, everywhere, were the lighter footmarks of the wolves. Some had moved to one side and rested while their brothers tried to seize the moose. The full-stretched impressions of their bodies in the snow were as perfect as though they'd been made a moment before. One wolf had been caught in a wild dash at the moose and had died under its heavy stamping. A few bones remained as witness. The two boys stopped again at a second stand. Here the great animal had fought with despair. As the snow indicated, he had been dragged down twice, and twice he shook off his enemies and gained his footing once more. He had finished his task long before, but nevertheless, life was dear to him. Zingha said it was a strange thing for the moose once down to struggle free again. But this one certainly had done so. The medicine man would see signs and wonders in this when they told him. Then they came to the place where the moose had tried to climb the river bank and go into the woods. But his enemies had attacked from behind until he leaped high and then fell back upon them, crushing too deep into the snow. It was clear that the kill was near because the two dead wolves had been left untouched by their brothers. The trail was red with blood now, and the distance between the tracks of the great beast had become shorter and shorter. 
Then they heard the first sounds of the battle, the quick bark of the wolves which spoke of teeth-tearing flesh. On hands and knees, Zingha and Kashkush made their way through the snow. Together they pushed aside the low branches of a young pine tree and looked forth. It was the end that they saw. The picture, like all of youth's memories, was still strong with him. His eyes now watched the end acted again as clearly as in that earlier time. Koshkush was surprised at this because in the days which followed he had done many great deeds. He had been the leader of men and his name had become a curse in the mouths of his enemies. For a long time he recalled the days of his youth until the fire grew cold and the frost bit deeper. He placed two sticks on the fire this time. Then he figured how much life was left by the amount of wood that remained in the pile. If Sitkam Ha had remembered her grandfather and gathered a larger armful, his hours would have been longer. It would have been easy, but she was always a selfish child. She had not honored her ancestors from the time the beaver, son of the son of Zing Ha, first looked at her. Ah, well, what did it matter? Had he not done the same in his own quick youth? For a while he listened to the silent forest. Perhaps the heart of his son might soften. Then he would return with the dogs to take his old father with the tribe to where the caribou ran thick and the fat hung heavy upon them. He strained his ears. There was not a sound to be heard. Nothing. He alone took breath in the middle of the great stillness. It was very lonely. Wait. What was that? His body suddenly felt cold. A familiar cry broke the silent air, and it was close to him. Then his darkened eyes again saw the old moose, the bloody sides, the torn legs, and the great branching horns fighting to the last. He saw the flashing forms of grey, the bright eyes, the dripping tongues, and the sharp teeth and he saw the circle move closer until it became a dark point in the middle of the stamped snow. A cold nose pushed against his face, and at its touch his soul leaped back to the present. His hand shot into the fire and dragged out a burning stick. Overcome for the moment by his fear of man, the beast drew back, raising a call to his brothers. Greedily they answered, until a ring of grey was stretched around him. The old man listened to the steady breathing of this circle. He waved his flaming stick wildly, but the beasts refused to scatter. Now one moved slowly forward, dragging his legs behind. Now a second, now a third, but now not one moved back from his flaming stick. Why should he so desire life, he asked, and dropped the burning stick into the snow. It made a slight noise, and then there was no more fire. The circle murmured uncertainly, but held its place. Again he saw the last stand of the old moose, and Koskush dropped his head hopelessly on his knees. What did it matter? Was it not the law of life? And that's our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories.